선생님 안녕하세요. 안녕하세요. 음, 별일 없으시고. 네. <웃음> 저번 주에는 저는 제주도에 있어서. 우와. 학회 없죠. 응? 학회 가셨던 거죠. 공학교육학회. 와. 참 저번에 보내드린 자료는 받으셨어요? 저 말씀하시는 거죠? 네, 잘 받았습니다. 뭐 가능성은 좀 있어요? 그... 아... 아... 그... 그... 아... 그... 그 애매하게 애매하게 그 포스코 관계자로부터 다음 과제에서 봅시다 이러고 딱 마무리를 하고 가셨는데 음. 이게 과제를 줄 테니 또 보자는 말이지 <웃음> 다른 과제에서 운 좋게 만나면 다시 봅시다 이제는 조금 애매해요 <웃음> 건설 건설 회사가 관심 있을 부분은 아니야. 음. 왜냐면 건설 기계이기 때문에. 네. 아 이게 그 사실 이제 제가 포스코 하고 이제 올해 과제가 마무리돼서 없는데 우리 다음 과제에서 봅시다 이러면 이게 만들어 주겠다는 뜻인지 <웃음> 아닌지 조금 애매하게. <웃음> 포스코 건설. 네. 아니 그 아니에요. 저희는 포스코 신사업팀. 음. 네네 한번 한한한한달 안에로 결과가 나올 것 같습니다. 오, 오늘 저기 제가 그한 것도 좀 포함시켰거든요. 한번 보시면 네. 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 또뭐뭐 뭐 만들어 봐야지. 음 그렇죠. 네. 교수님 강의 자료 한번 쭉 띄어. 아, 네, 한번 네. 제가 쉐어 스크린하고 음, 어, 네, 쉐어 한번 하고 지금 이제 풀 스크린, 풀 스크린 나오나요? 네. 네, 네 그럼 준비됐습니다. 사진 바꿔야겠다. 네? 사진 바꾸셔야 되겠어. <웃음> 그렇죠. 약간 사기죠. 아, 제 머리가 많았을 때라 <웃음> 최근 사진 쓰기가 싫어. <웃음> 아니, 근데 교수님의 평소 모습과는 좀 다른 분위기라서. 그래. 이게 이게 그 네, 거의 한 아, 벌써 5년 전이네. <웃음> 근데, 근데 지금 그 평상시에 교수님 더 자연스러운 
그러니까 웃, 웃는 모습이 더 자연스럽게 보이시는데 아까 그 사진 약간 좀 이렇게 <웃음> 뭐랄까요 이렇게 만든 어? 만든 <웃음> 만들어진 표정 같은 느낌이어서 <웃음> 이게 제가 거의 엔타이 포토제닉이라 아... 괜찮으신데요? 저희 거, 거의 포토포비아 있어요 아. <웃음> 그 제가 그 우리 학교에서 하는 케이모크에 뽑혀가지고 그 이제 온라인 수업을 만드는데 초안 이제 됐다고 보내주는데 아 도저히 볼 수가 없는 거예요 제가 제 모습을 <웃음> 그래서 아, 모르겠다 이거 알아서 내세요 이러고 저는 그냥 손 들었습니다 저는 연예계는 아마 평생 못갈것 같습니다 맞습니다 <웃음> 시간이 된것 같습니다 연예계 갈수 있는 사람 별로 없어요 아. 오케이, okay, everyone, if you are here, uh, please turn your camera on to make sure you are uh, paying enough attention. And uh, to help the lecturer <laughs> today to uh, actually interact with you guys. <laughs> Great, thank you. All right, so um, uh, Professor Jimmy Kim, do we have any announcement about the term project teams? Uh, yeah, uh, actually I already sent uh, the emails for each student uh, with respect to their team members. So with some email addresses. So I think uh, the students already started their term project with their team members yeah yeah i think so so yeah that is their announcement and in addition actually two weeks later the there will be the proposal presentation right so please prepare uh, the proposal presentation well uh and and they you guys have to prepare three minute video no for the proposal I'm, 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 I'm confused. I'm sorry about that. Also for the proposal, yeah. uh, each team is uh, encouraged to prepare three minute video, uh, even if they can, in, you know, they are quite confident then that they can speak in just three minutes. Well, it, usually it does not work out that way. So <laughs> uh, to give everyone equal uh, chance to speak within the class, uh, we really encourage you to prepare for the three minute uh, video of your pre presentation, both for proposal and final. But it doesn't have to be like, you know, movie, right? Uh, you can just uh, use your own PowerPoint slides uh, just to add your own uh, voices, right? So, okay. Then, uh, okay, everyone, today's uh, presentation will be from Professor Chu Hong Park, uh, who will be uh, presenting a fascinating topic. Uh, please welcome Professor Chu Hong Park. Okay, uh, hello everybody. Uh, can you hear me well? Okay, good. Um, okay, uh, today I will talk about uh, how can it solve about the problems in our future living and so-called great acceleration. So I will talk about what is the great acceleration. And uh, I'm not a prophet, but I will. I need, I need to talk about what could be our future. So uh, this is a little bit about, about my introduction. 
Uh, my name is Zhu Hong in Chinese. It's a basically column and giant. So basically, I am a giant column. <laughs> so I'm okay. So basically, I'm an architect uh, here. Um, actually, I don't know. My grandfather knew that I could be. I will be an architect, architecture related job. So he named me as a column. Uh, I, I was a, for a long time, I was an architect and I was a researcher at the MIT Media Lab and I was the professor at the School of Architecture before I joined the uh, post-tech as here at the Department of Convergence Site Engineering. Okay, so I'll talk about, okay. Um, okay. So I'll talk about a little bit about uh, Anthropocene that some of you already heard about it, but I will just a little bit. Um, so Anthropocene, uh, means the age of human. Um, however, it is not really a um, consensus notion yet. There are a lot of contradictions and there are a lot of arguments that is this really true or not? So it is really a kind of floating notion, but I will kind of a little bit introduce the idea itself. So uh, this is the, actually the history of Earth. I represented uh, as much as I can understand. So as you already know that uh, the history of Earth is 46, three zeros and three zeros and three zeros. So, um, but I, you already know that, that that's so fascinating. Uh, my favorite uh, time zone, that's a joke that a lot of uh, Jurassic Park movies are popular is actually, the time is actually a little bit about 10% of all uh, Earth's history. And actually the uh, Cenozoic, which is actually where the first human developed is actually, this the green bar is actually almost invisible. This is really kind of what, just a little bit, a half millimeter down of the top 1% top of the whole after Cambrian. And then after that, uh, Anthropocene, which is actually the current notion that how um, people, researchers develop the current time of the earth is really a little bit about the blue line, which is just a little bit, little bit, little bit of portion compared to the whole history of earth. So if we uh, compare that the whole earth as 80 year old guy or grandfather or grandma, the history of human is just 14 seconds. And then if you imagine that the whole history of Earth as 24 hour one day, actually the history of human is 0 0.55, 0 0.0005 second. And you probably may not well understand what is this short time in the history of Earth? So let's imagine together. And then what happened is that this little bit short amount of time, a lot of things happen. And it's almost impossible to read the text, however. Urbanization, water consumption, energy uses, human population, everything just increased exponentially. And actually, um, there are many researchers that one of the things that human can understand, human cannot understand is this kind of exponential growth. So, and then what happened in this time of acceleration is actually a lot of earthquake. How, and then this also includes a lot of population water use and the number of motor vehicles and paper production and the dams and rivers. And then a lot of, as you see that a lot of floods and frequency, the magnitude of earthquake are also exponentially increasing. And, and then what does this mean is this. The whole ocean is filled with trashes. Whole land is filled with trashes. And then another desert is filled with tires. And then bicycles. And then cars. I have to say that this one is actually a brand new car. 
Well, you probably heard about the Deezer, uh, Deezer gate that Volkswagen actually, um, uh, actually fake their result of diesel kind of a uh, uh, nitrogen gas, I'm not so sure. So because of that, they recall all the new cars and this is a, the park, the new cars. So they are, these are not used cars. And then airplanes. And then uh, this is the kind of like another research that shows that uh, this is all German, but it's actually fires in a mountain or volcano or temperature increase or storms, hurricane, and also earthquakes are exponentially increased due to the human population increase and actually the use of energy, the use of the abundant trashes and those kind of things. And also earthquakes are definitely increased significantly after 2000. We live in this kind of time period. And then this is actually one animation. Let's see, okay. Uh, sorry, that doesn't work. Um, but I just want to empathize that how does the earth understand, how should we understand that this kind of changes in this short amount of time considering the history of earth. So actually, and many of us actually doesn't understand the magnitude of seriousness of these changes. So let's imagine that, let's imagine that this is your face and then, and then also imagine that this is earth and then human, actually the Anthropocene means just 14 seconds of the, the, in the history of earth. And this is what happened to earth in 14 seconds. So this is the changes and the speed of changes that's, that's what's that's happening now. And then imagine that if this is actually one day, what happened that imagine that, take a look at about this is let's imagine that this is your human body or the tissue of your own on your hand or again on your face. This is what happened in 10 seconds. So this is the radical changes that our earth is currently experiencing now. Okay, so the, so here is kind of like, this is something what we need to think about. What could be the solution for this great acceleration? Seemingly, this is too fast. And, and imagine that probably many of you, before you join this class, that probably it is very nice fall. And after your dinner, you probably feel the, a kind of nice and chilly fall and then probably very quiet and hot and then peaceful but now actually if you take a look at the earth from the perspective of the earth actually earth is radically changing because of human activity and now what i'm trying to say is what we need to think about considering this radical changes and now uh, I'm introducing a kind of notion that called mediated situation as a solution for this great acceleration. Okay, so probably this one, you probably, many of you already uh, read these kind of articles these days. And robots are actually, yeah, replacing human workers, but actually uh, not this titles is important, but as much as important is actually, I uh, read, lined here, which means saying that forcing down wages. Why is this more serious? And why is this more scary? Is that consider that our human society is based on the increased salary or increased income considering uh, kind of accumulated human expertise. And imagine that after your graduation from bachelor's degree or, ma or master's degree, imagine that your annual income is $50,000. Imagine 30 years later, when you have children, when you have spouse, and then 
imagine that your salary is still $50,000. It is actually a serious problem to maintain your family. So McKinsey was one of the uh, best or one of the most well-known consulting company says that uh, where machines could replace humans and where they can't, meaning that divide the world, the world or the society that where machines should work and where humans should work. And then uh, this is this is imagine that this one is 2016. However, this one is highly surprising that the solution for this robotic world is simply dividing that divide these two kinds of species into let them work where they work best. And actually, this is not really a new concept. Uh, whenever there's a new technology, we humans uh, kind of approach the, uh, we approach to solve the problem in a very abstract way. And then actually that one of the great example is actually gun problem. So uh, one kind of humanity says that everyone should own a gun and the other type of human says that no one should own a gun. And what should we do? So actually one group says that uh, they kind of actually um, argue or they insist that to protect ourselves and to, to protect our daughters and children and to protect our elderly, let's educate how to use guns and protect themselves. And in the other side of people, actually, this is actually one of the shop in New York called the gun shop. Then the message that this gun shop tried to spread is every gun has a history. And then from this tag, this is actually one of the exhibition that says Veronica's and a two-year-old son. And actually, I don't know whether you can read this tag or not. So I kind of like highlighted a little bit. So What's the story about this nine millimeter, which is actually this size of a semi-automatic pistol, which is actually handgun, that uh, one woman always carries small gun in her wallet or on, in her bag. And one day uh, they visited Walmart and then accidentally her two-year-old found the gun and play with it and un unfortunately shoot it to her dad and his dad uh, was dead accidentally at the time. Can you imagine that? Or I don't know whether you have two year old boy or girl. I have a five year old boy now, but I, when I recall uh, how was he when he was two years old, two years old human being is almost impossible to survive without consistent uh, care by a dirt. And imagine that those kind of human who cannot support himself or herself or cannot sustain by himself or herself can kill another adult. So actually this one, this sketchy graph shows that United States is one of the country that has the largest number of people died by gun accident. And then this is showing that the, the United States populations are dissected into, into two groups that half of the population argue that uh, we should carry gun and half of the people that we should not carry gun. So argument is this. So those who argue that we should have a gun is that there are a lot of cars on the street and there are a lot of knives in a house, but actually they don't kill people. Actually it's the people who drive carelessly or who drive with drinking, or it's the people who actually kill another people. So it's okay to carry gun. But the another guru also says that without, actually, it's actually really the problem is actually gun, by having gun, actually it killed people. So actually the population is really dissected and actually there are very strong argument against each other. But here, uh, one, of, uh, one of my favorite uh, technology philosopher, Bruno Rattor, argued that these dissected arguments are not really see the essence of the problem. And he introduced the notion of gun gun met hybrid, actually it's the actor network, this is kind of a long story, but if I kind of like a, a very sh in shorten the long story that, he says that when a human being or man or woman at the time 
he or she carry a gun, then actually it translates both the people and the gun. And he says that it's a mediated situation. So he even actually, if I a little bit uh, exaggerate that he's kind of, his meaning is that those people who can carry a gun and who can use a gun is actually a kind of new species against, against other. And it's a kind of, uh, it's a kind of that a new species are evolved and this new species will dominate the whole, the new world. So here I kind of like a little bit more explain what is a mediated situation and how did I learn this mediated situation from my project. So this is actually Busan Cinema Center project that I was an architect in uh, Austria, Vienna. So, uh, so this one uh, was actually a two dimensional drawing. This one is almost e uh, year 2005 and six. And at the time, uh, it, uh, the CAT program was kind of uh, almost uh, matured yet. Uh, it was kind of difficult to develop 3D model of this kind of complex uh, shaped form. So actually the many official documents are just two dimensional representations such as plan like this or section like this. Of course we have three dimensional model, but if you are actually have a keen eye, you probably can recognize that the difference between structural drawings and the details of the model in the middle, because this one was developed by human a professional modeler who actually use a lot of super glues and cut manually all the little parts for a long time. So actually this one is actually a detailed model, but you probably can recognize that this one is totally wrong model that is not related to original CAD drawing. So actually this one, at the time I was working on the lighting design of the surface, but however, I don't have any 3D model from the architecture office. So I have to make one, but it was really time consuming job. So at the time I was lucky to know how to computer programming language and actually I can generate this three dimensional form. Then you probably can recognize that there are a lot of people underneath the, this, uh, the, this roof that is also kind of like programming, programmically generated human being like the, the current uh, Hollywood movie, like that you see a lot of zombies or a lot of uh, soldiers kind of fighting each other, but actually they are, are not really human beings. They're just computer graphic generated by algorithms. So actually I use kind of similar algorithms to generate those humans and also I kind of designed the surface and then actually, I, so I can work on the lighting design of the, this kind of this amazing roof surface. So actually this one is actually constructed, uh, finished work that which is actually in Busan of South Korea. It's just another view. And then actually interesting thing happened almost uh, simultaneously. Uh, Bokkape is actually a museum of contemporary uh, art and planning exhibition in Shenzhen, China. So uh, this one was actually uh, located in Shenzhen which is really above of Hong Kong. And actually, uh, this one is actually international competition. And this one was uh, the company's first proposal. And then interestingly, this one's supposed to be a single stage international design competition, meaning that after submitting one proposal, Chinese government should select one architect and the architect should got the uh, contract and should build one. However, uh, unfortunately, uh, Chinese government, particularly Shenzhen um, government officials actually didn't satisfy from any proposers. And then suddenly they changed the rule and then they selected five uh, finalists. And then of course we are selected with other, one of the best architects in the world at the time. And the problem was actually that the, the, the Shenzhen government officials announced that we should we are selected at the same time we should submit the second proposal in a week then everybody the officer was kind of like shocked that how, what should we do in a week and then but accidentally the architecture firm was actually located by my desk and then they kind of see that how i was working they're using computer programming and generating this kind of form so actually uh, they asked 
for me to have the kind of the second stage project, which is supposed to be finished in one week. And then actually, because I can generate very complex form by using the same algorithm that I used for the Busan project. So actually restart the project from a scratch. So this one is actually our new design, which is twisted and adapted volume, basically it's twisted geometry. And then this one is done by uh, architects. And then actually this is the one that I use. So actually I use the same art, the same program that I used for Busan project and I use it to generate the interior space. As you see here, actually, this is uh, quite similar to the previous one, but yes, you see that this one is way more simplified because we had no time at all. So structure and the window millions, stairs and the details in the back stairs, these are all generated. No human architect actually manually build it. And then this one is actually a structure study of main atrium. Then actually we can actually generate the structure. So actually we actually repeated three times to develop the central structure with structure engineer, but each iteration working with architectural designer and a structure, engine, a structure engineer supposed to be at least one month's job, but with three, within three days, we can finish the three iterations and develop the central structure. So actually this one was the actually finished, one of the finished interior design, and we were selected as a winner of this project. And then, transition, and then after we are selected, and this is actually also exterior design that also developed or generated by computer programming. And after we are selected, this is the professional image we actually uh, spread to the news medias and also uh, kind of mass medias and other government public uh, uh, announcement. And then actually uh, the, after the feedback, uh, the feedback from the, the Shenzhen officials that we heard uh, that why did why they selected us is not, unfortunate not because the design was good but because they selected us because we are the only architecture firm that actually redesigned everything or other four one of the world's best architect they just kind of like a, add a little bit details and a little bit cos cosmetic co uh, cosmetic changes so actually they were highly impressed about the speed that we work and actually, that's one of the reasons that we were selected. And now it's actually, the, it changed again. And then after that, actually, I changed. It, this one was when I worked in Austria, Vienna. And then uh, when I, I actually moved to uh, Office for Metropolitan Architecture that was in Netherlands, Rotterdam. And then at there, we have a similar problem. So actually, we were working on uh, ABN AMNO, which is one of the largest bank in Netherlands, and look, their headquarters is located at uh, Rotterdam. And then we were designing this iconic box with uh, empty void space in the middle. And actually, our main concept is that we want to create a public space like Pantheon in Netherlands, and then we want this public space become a commercial area or at, or at and or an office area at the hotel for the kind of the high uh, floors areas. And actually, this is actually one of the beautiful shots that we created. And actually, this one is a really iconic uh, project in Netherlands in that year. Uh, it's one of the favorite project. It's a kind of national project at the time. And one of the problem here is that as you see that each floor has a kind of curved a facade or curved windows and two, and then actually drawing or generating this curved facade is actually almost, almost kind of all year long time consuming job. And so actually when a directors wanted to change anything or architects and junior architects kind of resist uh, any kind of changes because a little bit of changes actually created a lot of changes, a lot of work over nine days and night. So we are kind of like a resisted to change any, anything here. So at the time I asked to uh, my uh, senior architect, hey, give me just one day. I write a program and I generate, I, I will automate this design process because at that time, uh, using a computer pro computer programming in architectural design is really unusual thing. It's kind of like weird that uh, it's kind of anyway it's so weird. So I kind of like I need the permission to from my uh, seniors that I will work on computer programming 
And because that's kind of, I have to say, it's a really weird thing in architecture office. So, and he, he kept kind of like a think weird that what, what, what he's trying to do. And actually this is the software that I generated in one day. So kind of, I create a kind of voice area and then automatically I subtract these volumes out of a cube. So actually it generate a lot of generations. So actually the, even the bigger problems that we have five void areas, not just one. And then this one is actually parametrically changing in terms of scales and in terms of directions. So actually, and then after that, it automatically creates the architectural design. So the result is that, so it, I have a kind of like 2000s of pages of records that actually have all the collections of parametric changes and resultatory the uh, light and shadow studies in the Netherlands, they need, uh, they, the light is very important to design factor uh, in Rotterdam particularly. So I have to generate for each design changes, I generated best case, worst case, and average case means a summer, winter, and some day in a fall, and from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., I kind of generated all light and shadow studies per each design, each parametric design changes. So uh, we actually uh, successfully improved our designs. And then strange thing happened one month later. So after one month later, we, at the time we have a kind of monthly reviews from the uh, Rotterdam municipality. And then actually uh, after one month of kind of hard working like 9 a.m. to 2 a.m., uh, no, no, no holidays. And then after one month later, just one day before, actually just several hours before the monthly review, we just realized that, oh, we didn't prepare the new light and shadow study of the new updated design. And we are kind of, oh, we are so tired and that we have no time. And just, and then at that time, one intern asked me that, hey, can you check about the old, uh, the multiple thousands of books that we have collected? And then actually it may have something similar, a uh, light and shadow study, so we can just reuse it. So we check all the books and surprisingly, of course, not exactly the same. However, we have a light and shadow studies that is highly close to the updated design. So we actually used it. So we successfully present the design for the monthly review. Then I have I have very strange idea that what if, what if instead of like seven professional architects, one of the hardest workers in the world, working hard for the month, what if I just worked for another day to update the designs? Then can the um, computer generated design can replace human workers? Then actually kind of like I was really, really serious about this automated design concept and artificial intelligence that generate architecture, architecture design for human architects. So since then, actually, so this is the one of the kind of final rendering at the time. And then actually, this is one of the experience that I had that can design be automated. At the time, it was very strange notion. Like, of course, now we are actually quite familiar with artificial intelligence, deep learning, uh, neural networks. So it's just kind of like a, we see all the possibility, 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 uh, possibilities, but at the time it was very strange and it was kind of, I just glimpsed the ideas. So actually, um, so um, I kind of now uh, learned about what is a mediated human machine. So this is actually um, one of the projects that you probably already see from many movies or uh, already, but however, at the time I presented my work, it was quite difficult for me to explain what am I doing. So in this movie, uh, this uh, this cop actually um, so actually uh, to ask the robot that why do you kill uh, your professor? Then the robot says, "I didn't." Robots don't feel fear. So then he said that robot don't feel anything. They don't hungry. Then the robot said, "I do." The the robot says, "I have even dreams." Then he said, "Robot has no dreams." Humans is a dream of that. You're just a machine. Imitation of 
you are just imitation of human light. Can a robot write a symphony? So he says that robot write a can symphony. Robot turn a canvas. Robot into turn a, a canvas masterpiece. into a beautiful masterpiece. Can you? Then robot says, "Can you?" Then I was freezed as much as him. And what if I say that that uh, if we divide human beings or robots, uh, that if those who can produce a masterpiece or, or a things that write a great symphony can be a human and those who cannot produce those masterpieces are robots. And unfortunately, we are all robots. Because like uh, Michelangelo or Leonardo da Vinci or Bach or Monet, or any famous artists or those who produce a lot of creative masterpiece, actually they were kind of historically supported by uh, rich companies or rich families. It's kind of kind of things like that. You are you win a kind of like international cello competition in age of four or five, and then actually a kind of a conglomerate like. Huawei or Samsung or IBM or Google just, hey, we decide to support you for the rest of your life and you just, just focus on your own learning of cello or just focus on your writing symphony or just focus on your drawing of paint. And actually that kind of things never happen these days anymore. So we will stay as a robot these days. So now uh, Negro Ponti, actually, who was the founder of uh, Media Lab, one of the four or five founders of uh, Media Lab uh, in 1969, 40 years ago, so says that uh, he actually mentioned about architectural machine. And then he described what is the architectural machine he imagined. He imagined then he says that this discussion is not about machines that necessarily can do architecture. So it's not a machine that do art, it, it simply can do architecture. It is a preface to machines that can learn about architecture and perhaps even learn about learning about architecture. So it's really interesting concept. So kind of he imagined a machine that learns about what we do and even he can meta learn about architecture. And actually the interesting part is actually later part. So he called this machine as architecture machines and he didn't say it is a machine. What is actually said was the partnership of an architect with such a device is a dialogue between two intelligent systems, the man and the machines. And what he imagined is actually it's not the machine and it's, he says it's a collaboration or it's a dialogue between machine, basically it's artificial intelligence and human intelligence. And actually he's, why he says this? Because he says, because he thought that this is the dialogue, the collaboration is capable of producing an evolutionary system. So he thought that if we need to create a something new or if you think of something evolutionary work or something a masterpiece, that's supposed to be that could be and only possible when human and the machine collaborate. So this one is actually a very interesting concept to me. So actually, I, I want to be uh, actually, uh, before I, uh, I you know, so actually, um, I want actually, I, for a long time, I kind of uh, researched this kind of collaboration between humans and machine. So this is one of the project that I did that uh, this is a, a drawing machine and then actually I, I generate an algorithm and the, this robot actually holds the pencil and actually draws actually uh, this kind of uh, uh, pencil drawing. Actually this, actually this one is actually flocking algorithm that actually birds are actually flocking in a space. Actually this robot is actually tracing its moment of its birds one at a time, but as a collective form, it creates a kind of abstract pattern. And next one is actually a, a water painting. So actually, I, I actually replaced the pencil with a brush, and it the brush actually actually pick a drop of water at a time and, and draws a curves one at a time, and actually create this kind of river flow, um, kind of like water painting. I really like the subtle 
uh, kind of like a subtle kind of like merge of uh, this kind of like a cloudy feeling out of from it to a brush. And this is kind of uh, one of the things that I try to create. And this one is actually weaving. So this one is using very simple synth machine, but it can that actually that kind of weave uh, strings. And actually this is the, the result of two different actually weaving structure that I made. And this is actually the result that it, it has a very interesting light and shadow a pattern generation depending on time and seasons. And then this is actually one of the, uh, this is actually a tensegrity structure that I was interested, in, but also one of the most uh, notorious project. And then actually this one is almost like a disappearing in the world of architecture because it is very difficult to build, they're very difficult to design. And one of the biggest problem of this uh, project has is actually there's a no use of this structure in architecture because it has no floor, it has no uh, envelope, it is very difficult to build it. So actually nobody, is, there's no, actually literally there's no use of this kind of idea uh, in architecture field. So, but I was highly interested that the, I, the, the fascinating part for me is that it was very difficult to generate, uh, this very difficult to design and build. So actually at the time we actually use uh, genetic algorithm that actually, uh, if there is like a basic uh, uh, envelope of design, then my algorithm actually create a, a genotype and phenotype, and it'll create a lot of mutations. And actually, it's sorted based on the design variation, it's a structural performance, and it selected one of the best 10%, and it creates another genotype, phenotype, and the mutation. And actually, it repeated this kind of selection and improved process kind of like 1,000 times. And after that, we have almost highly almost optimized design structure. And then actually this is one of the research and then we use this sort of fabrication technology such as 3D printing. And then amazingly, we, it just become like a Lego. Then I just use pick and place. Then the, the, the extremely difficult job become like Lego project. So this, and then that, at that time it was so easy to build, I thought, so, so even we add some kind of inter, uh, in, uh, kind of like interactive features such as uh, responsive lighting. Uh, unfortunately, when we build it, actually we have a nightmare, days and days of nightmare because it was so, the, in a large scale, it was so difficult to build actually. Uh, so, and, and actually this was the result and uh, magically, it, works so well, it balanced, structure balanced so well. And actually we just rented this museum space uh, three days only for uh, actually one week only for the fabrication and video recording and research picture. But actually accidentally a uh, senior professor just passed by and they were amazed by this project and it become a permanent exhibition of uh, at, the, at the time at the University of Miami. And then, uh, and then actually accidentally NASA was actually, was research, have researched uh, at the time about this tensegrity robotic structure. So we got luckily uh, got grant from NASA and then we were actually working on uh, this uh, robotic system. And then actually when I came back to Korea, actually we had another exhibition in one of the largest uh, art museum in Korea. And it, this was actually the exhibition part at the first year. And the second, we, are, we even developed this robotic system into a uh, uh, autonomous driving system. And this is the robot that is actually read environmental space and move by itself, avoiding any obstacles. Uh, I wish that I can make it a little bit faster. I will just kind of run it. Okay, so to show that how does it work. Uh, Professor Kwok, <laughs> I have a lot of presentations. So if you think that I'm over time, just stop me anytime. So I'll play. Okay, uh, I'll just wait that it. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we have to. So actually, this is the robot exhibition. Uh, so actually, so later, then actually I in, in deafening my research that 
how can an uh, artificial intelligence can actually generate automatically design instead of human architect? So um, this one is actually really the basic form of artificial neural network. This is one of the oldest form of uh, AI or ANN, fit for network. So that here is actually uh, my program that actually, uh, it actually, maybe just input the legal requirements or any sustainable factor, view factor, of any, so any other environmental requirements or legal requirement or formal requirement, we just add those parameters. And then it actually generates all kind of different form that optimize those requirements. So actually this one is actually showing all the uh, generated form. And then after that, uh, it actually perform the um, uh, architectural uh, kind of value out of it. For example, this is actually one example of comparative study uh, of a research lab building near MIT. So actually this one is known as Kendall Lab. And then this one is designed and constructed by one of the best laboratory expert architectural design firm in LA. And then this firm has uh, longer than 10 years of experience uh, focusing on research lab building design. And then here in the right image, the orange area shows that where the, uh, the most appropriate laboratory space and the yellow means actually uh, less appropriate and so than the space that's supposed to be used other than laboratory space. And when we compare this spatial uh, uses with the Kendall lab, actual lab building, accidentally actually these two design actually has the common uh, space design layout. Yeah. So for example, this lab has atrium in the middle and commercial space in the first and second floor, just like the diagram that I have. And this one has all the laboratory space around the uh, boundary area of a building, just like my uh, program analyzed. So, uh, I mean, this one uh, could be just accidental. However, this one just kind of exemplified the possibility of AI can design human architect, human architect who are uh, specialized in research lab design. So um, now I kind of like, I was kind of like excited about this idea, but however, it, so kind of like I was uh, kind of that computer program language is one of the key knowledge that or architect is supposed to learn. So actually I was, uh, so this is one diagram shows that internationally, 33% 30, 30, 30 of uh, students who took introductory program language failed to learn computer program language, meaning that uh, this one is in terms of number, this one was 165,000 students worldwide every year. So meaning that more than 100,000 students want to learn computer programming, but once they took introductory computer programming, this number of students just decide, I will never, I'll stop learning computer programming languages. So this one was very serious problem in computer science department at the time and even now. So kind of like I developed a machine learning tutor that actually traced how uh, students learn their kind of like their learning behavior, their learning data. And then actually the AI can provide a kind of customized learning contents. And by doing so, I hypothesized that participants who learn computer programming language from AI tutor more than students who just simply learn from uh, just uh, internet or like online course. So actually this is one of the modules that I kind of prepared. And then actually, I actually prepared the 200 of these kind of modules. So left side is actually machine learning tutor and the right side is non-machine non learning tutor as a control group. So uh, I randomly uh, divide participants into two groups and those groups who took a machine learning tutor actually uh, received this kind of colored feedback. What it means is the more red texture is just saying that uh, students who showed be a similar pattern, similar learning patterns to you will like this project. So it's kind of like a Netflix algorithm that 
if you like a like kind of like if you uh, liked uh, kind of like a violent or something kind of warlike movie, then the Netflix will kind of show you more kind of fighting movies. If you like romantic movies, then actually you will have more romantic movies in the screen of Netflix. So after actually, so I conducted a cross-sectional and longitudinal analysis out of it. And as you see that uh, here in the meantime, so upper part is actually machine learning tutor and lower part is non-machine learning tutor. Uh, definitely uh, those who participated in machine learning tutor definitely longer, 72 minutes versus 49 minutes. So definitely machine learning tutor studied longer than non-machine learning tutor, um, non-machine learning tutor participant. This one is, a, is also a cross-sectional study that uh, machine learning tutor uh, have a higher average, have higher mean, and also overall very, very high uh, studying time. Oh, actually, this one is a visiting number. So meaning that participants who learn from machine learning tutor visited almost double. And then when we compare to a uh, longitudinal study, that uh, the left side is actually machine learning tutor and or accumulated and uh, this right side is non-machine learning tutor. What we can find that what we can find out from this in this pattern is that machine learning participants participants learn more dynamically than non-machine learning tutor participant participant. So as a result, so this one is just one example of longitudinal study that do the uh, of a student who took machine learning tutor just dynamically keep going and back. Uh, back and forth and learning and study longer. However, machine learning, non-machine learning tutors are simply learn from chapter one, two, three, four, extremely linearly, except that there is a, some kind of exams or assignment. So, so kind of this one is actually uh, one of my exponential study that this one is actually a natural log uh, graph out of it. So this, the left side is actually uh, machine learning and right side is non-machine learning. And as you see that here is the slope is very slightly, almost horizontal, but non-machine learning is actually slightly uh, slowed down. But actually, please understand that this one is log scale, meaning that log scale is every, the, in log scale, every double is actually, it is squared, meaning that this very even though it looks like very slow speed slow rate graph this one is extremely significant to drop out so actually this one is one of the biggest well-known problem of online studies that a lot of people just take first or second uh, sections or second chapters of online study but just after three or four the majority of particip participants just drop out from online courses so considering that actually uh, machine learning to machine learning tutor participants, they maintain their studying time, which is machine learning tutor actually works quite effectively. But however, at the beginning of the study, uh, machine learning participants has higher uh, study time than non-machine learning tutor, but statistically there's no significant uh, uh, importance here. So actually, machine learning tutor, non-machine learning tutor, at the beginning, they don't affect them much to the participants. And then even actually I go deeper. So this is one of the atypical uh, midterm review or final review of uh, architecture's uh, project, meaning that when there is a kind of midterm review, students prepare a lot of diagrams or architecture plans, sections, or perspectives. And actually only experienced architectural professors can understand uh, the intention or the expression or the desire of students to present it, uh, transforming his original ideas into architectural form. This is only human and only architecturally trained and experienced teachers can provide. So, but kind of like I was questioned that, can a machine do that? as if a, a human instructors do. So this is actually a kind of a, a program that I developed. So actually this is actually consists of a camera. If a student 
show his architecture plan, it just it just not read the graphic styles of it. It reads the meta meaning or the meaning of the graphics, and then it finds a similar architecture project from Google. So intentionally, I changed the original image from white and black, and also I I changed the scale of it, and even I changed the directions of it. So actually, to prove that my computer vision tutor simply not reading the graphic style, simply comparing pixel by pixel, I want to prove that my computer vision tutor can read the meaning of architecture and find it from historical examples. So actually, I changed the original. Is this this one is the original, very small, and then I just take out just a little part out of this original image and. And then I enlarge it and then change it a uh, black, uh, I inverted the color and I only showed little center of the image. And then my computer vision tutor actually analyzed this image and find the uh, kind of historic project out of it. And then voila, this one actually find the exact image from this uh, heavily uh, changed uh, graphics. So, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, roughly about 50 participants joined this project. And then I asked that, how do you evaluate the feedback from the civic tutor? And then they just said that 50%, uh, so kind of many of them said satisfied, but still uh, many, uh, but actually a little bit of percent say they're unsatisfied. Overall, many participants satisfied about the result. And then I also asked how useful is the feedback to improve your design and then actually many participants say that more 85% says that it was kind of useful. And then I also say that how, basically I'm kind of measuring the performance of my developed the CV tutor to participants. And then how does, how related this is the feedback to your design and happened over roughly about 60% said related, but actually 20% said that it is not related. And also, uh, and then it, this is the interesting part that how do you evaluate the, how do you evaluate the feedback of this machine learning tutor compared to your previous human instructor's feedback? And actually, interesting part is that less than half are says equally equivalent, but actually quite many portions says that uh, human is still better. So actually, my machine, of course, that. Uh, my machine learning tutor need to be improved. And then actually, uh, I also have some subjective questions that and actually many people, many participants have, have a feeling that it is quite not natural or it is um, strange to learn something from machine at the time. So, so now, so why we should do this kind of human machine collaboration? Uh, okay, this one is actually a little bit back of story. Okay, so now, um, Let's kind of talk about how we, uh, why do we, why do we develop this kind of human machine collaboration or digital analog collaboration or a physical digital uh, twins collaboration? Okay. So uh, this one is show that rapid urbanization. You probably see this kind of presentation already from the previous one, two, three presentations. So I basically all the population now these days are centered into a city. And the problem of course is that this one is after 2000 urbanization becoming almost um, extremely changed. Yeah, so uh, this is the problem that we have now that the population of Pohang city that where I live now is actually the population is decreasing. Basically many suburban areas or non-urban areas are actually basically disappearing. Now, uh, contrast to that, uh, many cities is too much urbanized, too much population is kind of like concentrated in little area. So uh, as you probably may know that Singapore is actually developing a district twin of a city country. So actually they make a district twin of a city and then they kind of like simulate a problem. They kind of simulate a pro idea of a problem and then they evaluate 
uh, the solution in a virtual world, and then actually they select one of the best solutions out of it, they test it, and they apply those uh, that prove the solution into a city. City is kind of like a medical domain. Uh, they are highly uh, conservative and protective because imagine that a doctor uh, who want to, uh, who actually explained, oh, you need a surgery. Do you want to try a new surgery method or, or already proved surgery method? And of course, you want a, something already historically proved surgery method you want to apply to your body because you don't want to take any risk. City is kind of like that. No one wants to take a risk. As a result, only proved solutions are applied to a city and very, very few uh, emerging solutions are being applied or they just rarely try. So uh, Postec also want to develop a district twin three years ago. Unfortunately, the cost of it was over $500,000 for this little building. Imagine that, it just a little, little campus cost them much. How much will it cost for a little city like Pohang? multi-billion dollar will be required to develop a, develop a district twin of a small city. So kind of like, I kind of like, I kind of like thought that, oh, district twin is an amazing idea, but in reality, it is impossible to build a district twin currently. So now, uh, so kind of, I think about another solution that there are a lot of kind of like city view, like, uh, you know, Google street view in Korea, neighbor street view, then I kind of thought about it. can we use those collect already collected 2D image data to generate kind of 3D dessert twin out of it? So this is, is one of my research that actually generating um, uh, three-dimensional geometry out of uh, three-dimensional or out of a lot of two-dimensional images. So uh, after I tested in a virtual world, this one is I tested in a physical world that I kind of 3D printed the same geometry. And then I take, a phys I take a photo of it and apply the algorithm that we developed. So then we actually, this one is the one of the result. So this is very uh, kind of very close to the one that we acquired from a digital simulation. And this one is actually actual uh, result from a physical uh, picture. And then this one is one of the uh, uh, test of a house project. Of course, it is not that good. However, uh, this one is actually one of the results that my algorithm generated out of the 3D printed uh, architecture model. And then rather than we can extract some dimensional information and we use it for generating it. So now this one, after kind of the past, we tested the possibility of creating building information model or this twin using automated system. And the next step is how can we uh, transform this uh, virtual model into physical uh, construction? So this is one of the, uh, one of my project that's showing that, um, uh, this is a robot I'm actually um, uh, cutting uh, to the uh, medium density board. And actually this is the result that we created. And then this one is actually my robot arm war. That so this uh, war is designed by uh, computationally designed, and then actually we automatically created a robot pass algorithm, and the robot arm is actually stacking uh, these wood bricks and created the right one here. Uh, this one is very slow. I'm sorry that, but as you see, you see that the robot arm pick a brick one by one. And then it stack and rotate slightly, and it keep it keep repeat those kind of doing again and again and again. And then this is one of the results that we created. Uh, we are highly satisfied about the fact that as you see here, this each brick is rotated to kind of one degree per stack. So by doing so, this one is one extender. Saturday morning, I visited my lab, and actually sun coming from the window the other side. However because the robot, each brick has different angle. The certain part of a brick is reflect those sunlight. And actually, uh, I have to say it was really beautiful at the time. And this is one of the results. And this is another one that, 
this is animation. Oh, sorry, that. Oh, okay. So this is actually a robot animation that is stacking a bit. And this one is actually, is this one is kind of curved robot arm that no human brick workers can actually stack this kind of subtle angle change uh, robotic work. And this one is currently exhibited in my lab, those three words that we made. And the next one is actually, we uh, tested a uh, wood construction. So actually you see is actually the gap between wood slit is actually sine curve variation. So by doing so, this one has very interesting light transmitting effect, uh, based depending on the angle that uh, user, uh, our, our users uh, actually see the project. And this is just one of another, my favorite, a virtual project. It has a kind of beautifully curved a ceiling that turn into war and then another turning back into ceiling. But it is almost impossible to construct it in a physical world. We need a very highly complex uh, framework to develop it. So I use a robot arm to create a, this kind of precisely curved robotic framework so we can actually pour concrete and actually we can create the beautiful design that I showed in a previous slide. And this is actually a robotic collaborative robot that actually uh, one by one is a kind of create a curved work. And this is one of the animation that our second version of the woodwork that it even has a more subtle changes from half millimeter to 30 to 40 uh, millimeter changes. So it has a, it create a lot of visually interesting and lighting effect. Uh, I really uh, recommend for you to come to the Postec and see the, uh, this kind of nice visual. So actually it have a kind of like a transparency yet also this one has a kind of opaqueness depending on angles. Okay, so this one is actually, so now I, or my lab developed a robotic uh, 3D printer. Uh, this one is basically robotic ceramic printer. This one is our pre-study of developing robotic uh, concrete uh, 3D printer. So actually, um, this is the kind of collection of my current one. And probably, yeah, you can see some of the reserved. Yeah, so actually this one is actually, so current 3D printing uh, study is all limited by using gravity, meaning that 3D printing, the one of the uh, kind of like uh, premises uh, that a 3D printing requires is that this all material is actually going down following the gravity. So all we can do is basically a uh, vertical sticking. So the, one of the easiest part is actually, you probably see that all the work that you probably uh, uh, see is actually all vertically uh, stacking or column-like structure. And then another one is actually those the, in the middle, what we are creating is, this one is so-called the Lindenmeyer system, which is actually just like a brain a structure. A lot of very thin shells are folded and folded and folded. So but even those are uh, compared to completely filled volume, it, it uses very uh, small amount of material. Still, it may have a similar structure integrity compared to the fully uh, filled uh, volume structure. And then in the right side, you, you see that two years ago, there was a, a centennial competition by NASA, which is actually uh, one of the requirements is actually really build 3D printed habitats uh, automatically without intervening of human engineers or any uh, people intervention. And then actually this one is actually winning project, meaning that the geometry is extremely simple circle and just vertically stacking. So, and then we want to actually overcome this kind of limitation of 3D printing. So uh, what we do is actually we generated a kind of horizontal and minimalize and minimizing the amount of support material and actually we 3D print on top of our uh, computationally generated minimum support structure. By doing so, we can create kind of horizontally curved uh, 3D printed uh, tiles or forms. Okay, and then uh, another project that we have is, uh, so uh, another uh, exponential problem is actually environment. So uh, one of the uh, fatal work in the United States is actually construction. 
and in and and in Korea, a lot of uh, the, uh, generators have accident. Uh, many people are uh, died or um, damaged in the kind of like, kind of basement uh, factory because of the gas leak, uh, very uh, kind of gas leak kind of things. So actually, um, at first time we wanted to use a drone to detect any hazardous gas, but one of the problem with drone is that the propellers actually kind of diluted uh, the gas density. So it is almost impossible. So it was too late to detect those gas because kind of because of this kind of a gas dilution. So instead, uh, we actually develop a kind of uh, air balloon style robot. So actually, this air balloon robot has uh, has actually uh, sensors underneath, and so far it slowly floats in the air in a factory. And actually, it can actually uh, effectively detect a uh, hazardous gas and then actually report to the central monitoring station and then inform uh, laborers or workers before they were kind of like, uh, before they were hurt. And this is a kind of like computational process of developing this air balloon structure and uh, many failures, actually dying fishes that in my lab. And another uh, issue in construction uh, problem is that we still in Korea in the winter, particularly for construction, uh, a concrete construction process in the winter, uh, we use this kind of old style heating system, basically charcoal. And then one of the problem is uh, in winter construction environment, after pouring concrete uh, to prevent any freezing, uh, of the water in a concrete, uh, many people, many companies use this kind of old style heating. One of the problem of this heating system is every three hours, they have to replace uh, charcoal to new one. But at the time, uh, many workers uh, entered into protected area. And actually many cases, there are a, uh, too much uh, CO2 and then few uh, oxygens. So because of that, uh, there are every year at least 10 workers uh, have died in Korea. So uh, we have an idea that let's create a ball like robot. So actually this one is actually uh, O2 sensor or CO2 sensors. And they can, we can develop it less than, okay, the sensor itself is actually quite expensive. The sensor is kind of like a, almost like uh, $200, but Casing is a 3D printer, so it was just less than $20. So this one is very cheap and economic sensors can be carried by any uh, construction workers. And before they enter into construction site, they just roll a ball and then actually there's an LED light in the middle. So if it is red, it is dangerous to enter into. If it is green, it is safe to go into and then replace charcoal. And then we even, we have a better idea that what if we develop a ball robot so actually it can come back. So we can actually recycle all the time. So this is one of the projects that we developed a robotic ball. So actually this robot actually roll itself on the construction field. And if it comes to red, it is dangerous. Then actually it comes back to the worker, come back. And then we just we can, re can uh, reuse it again and again and again. Uh, so then after that, we just saying, that, oh, please don't come here. That is so dangerous here. And then actually it'll, doesn't show that it come back, but it is uh, it run by itself. And then another project is actually food. So actually we develop, we wanted to develop a smartphone. Uh, as I told you uh, in the first presentation, one of the biggest problem of robotic system is that it 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 it, it reduce our uh, wages, meaning that over time after again the, this problem is very serious that. After 30 years later, my salary is still $50,000 as much as $50,000 right after I graduated. Meaning I have a wife, I have two kids, and $50,000 is not, definitely not enough. Meaning that my wife need to work and probably my children may need to work to maintain a family. And one of the one of, another hurdle is that food price index is increasing. Let's see the graph together compared to uh, compared to lowest one, only 2000. And after 10 years later, 
the food index become from 100 to 220, meaning that compared to 10 years ago, to buy a little, a liter of milk, if you pay 1,000, maybe you pay $1 10 years ago, now we pay $2. And then imagine that this one, after 30 years later, if you pay $1 per, and again, this one is doubled every 10 years, exponential. So after 30 years later, it could be $8. Very serious problem. So how can we solve this kind of problem? And then also water withdrawal, meaning that all the many cities will have a problem because there is few water to drink or few, fewer water to use it for agriculture or industries. So kind of like a, in current, in based on the uh, situation in 2019, the minimum initial investment cost to build a smart farm is $5 million, meaning that if you want to build a smart farm, you need $5 million as an initial cost. And the problem is that annual production outcome is $2 million in average, meaning that your investment return will come two and a half years later if everything goes well. And I thought that this one is very serious problem. I don't know. I mean, this one is actually a worldwide effect. If I have a 5 million, I can buy a house in Seoul or somewhere in suburban area in, in around, nearby Seoul. And if I buy it like three years ago, now it will be $7 million. And then I have probably, I don't know, but I will have a quite annual income if I rent the house to other people. So actually, there is no reason to invest my money to a smartphone, actually. So actually, uh, so now how can we solve this problem? So I kind of, let's make a machine. So let's kind of historically, coffee machine used to be $7,000 about, about roughly 10, 20 years ago. Now, probably some of you have already nice coffee machine in your home uh, that will be less than $150. What does this mean? Uh, actually, it, at the first time commercial coffee machine come, it was, $20,000 like 30 years ago and it was as much as, it was as much expensive as a house but now uh, uh, several uh, 23 30 years later it just become as cheap as i don't know your shoes so now uh, i develop a very uh, micro smart micro smartphone so basically this one is micro bolt card smartphone uh, I kind of uh, say that uh, zero point system. So it, it wastes zero space, it wastes zero water, it wastes zero nutrients and case and zero waste. So what I do was I kind of, I 3D printed clay or ceramic pot. Uh, and then actually I can, then this is one of the, my prototype I created. And then I use a computer vision technology to detect the growth and the direction of each leaf and identify the location. And then I can provide or water or nutrients only the leaf with the only the amount requires. So actually this one is actually my computer vision test that identify the location of each pot. And actually this one is, can be randomly located just anywhere you use actually located my computer vision machine, identify the location, it provide water. And then this one is actually my animation test that my, my camera detects the vector of each leaf and then when, when each leaf become down, actually it detects the moment, meaning that it knows the when exactly the water is required. So, <clears throat> so now actually I developed this robot arm. So uh, kind of, uh, in the news media, so actually my camera detects the leaf and then it provides the exact amount of water. And then this is another demonstration that it detects the location of a leaf and then provide like water and between to each leaf. And this one, uh, okay. And then actually this one is actually one of the uh, parts that actually have this kind of uh, smart actually the water supply. Uh, so um, here's actually kind of uh, my last one. So uh, 
the kind of the I kind of explain about what is the uh, acceleration and actually the I kind of try to convince you the gravity of acceleration and how difficult it is to solve that uh, a kind of a rapid changes. And actually, my favorite philosopher Bruno Latour in the in the conference also in the book of Waiting for Gaia Gaia, and then he said he said that. What do we do when questions are too big for everybody, and especially when they are much too grand for the writer? I mean, as a, for me, I actually exactly the same feeling. So to solve this accelerated or exponentially growing problem is just too huge and too big to solve. Even I am scared to even thinking about attacking or thinking about to solve the problem is actually two big questions for me. And then he actually explained why we feel those kind of feelings that one of the reasons why we feel so powerless when asked to be concerned by these questions that the reason why to begin with feels so powerless. So there's really nothing I can do. And it's because of the total disconnect between the range, nature, and scale of the phenomena, meaning that those kind of like earth scale problems, earth scale changes are, I believe that nobody is connected to those problems. There's no such a major that solves that kind of ocean filled with trashes, a desert filled with tires, or the food that the price is always increasing or doubled. And in this kind of phenomena, our emotion or heavy of thoughts are filling our crisis and to be respond to them is just, he says that it's just simply more than a passing it. So meaning that this listen and just pass it. So my research, so here that uh, what I argue and my research is largely you know, about this disconnect and what to do about it meaning by simply connect so kind of if there is a solution or there probably if we can find a solution that solution is connecting everybody work together and this working together not just means human beings we need to work with humans machines everybody to be survived in this Ethno, uh, ethno, uh, ethno, uh, ethno, ethno, sorry, I, 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 my premise is going on. So this kind of like human word, human earth. So uh, this is my last page. Okay, and thank you very much for this long uh, presentation. Okay, uh, probably you're abandoned by this presentation, but welcome any comment or... <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. Thank you, uh, Professor. Per, yes. Uh, how about to have just a short break before uh, yes, the sure. discussion? Yeah. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to suggest to have like fifteen minute break. Is it okay to you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right, so see you at, uh, at 8.40. Yeah, 8.40, 8.40. Yeah. Okay, see you then.
Okay, um, is everyone back? Okay, I bet you guys have a lot of questions for Professor Park, right? Um, so please go ahead. Who wants to go first? You can just raise your hand. Or just start speaking. Okay, may I start? Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Uh, yeah, I uh, understand that there are so many uh, new technologies here uh, implemented uh, in our real life. Mm -hmm. uh, and I understand that uh, your first uh, field was architecture uh, and automatization of uh, work mm -hmm. of architecture. Uh, but uh, how I see it today, uh, we have some beam technologies, we have some um, AutoCAD, uh, Revit, and so on. But uh, the technologies that you mentioned are not really um, shared uh, are not really usual to use uh, between uh, technology uh, between some architectures who uh, build some accommodation uh, buildings and so on uh, can you explain why it's so why we don't uh, use uh, this uh, uh, new technologies uh, in basic uh, architecture yeah oh, is it uh, level uh is it your background is architecture no no not really but i'm really interested in uh, the sphere uh, unfortunately i'm not architecture uh, uh my background uh in uh public administration and now i'm uh, in yonce on the urban planning and engineering yeah uh, it's a kind of same issue that um, many developing countries do not want to hire female engineers. Yeah, yeah. Many male engineers are scared of working with female engineers. Why though? Uh, it's kind of cultural thing. So uh, my uh, advisor at MIT, uh, uh, who was William Mitchell, he is one of the founder at the MIT Media Lab. Uh, personally, we had a small party with, in his house and he told me that he was one of the first generation who uses computer programming in architectural design at the time he was at Harvard University. And he told me, he told me that many professors at Harvard and many senior architecture architects in architecture field at the time considered him as an evil. Because architecture at the time is kind of like a very artistic and very um, fine art like field. And in that field, my professor, my advisor was the first pioneer who used actually computer programming language. It looks very scary to other field, other experts. And actually I have to, 
<laughs> my son is here and waiting for me to work with. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, it's kind of like a cultural thing and a kind of self-protection thing. And, uh, but the issue is almost everywhere and it's related to the theory of feminism that here's the thing. Um, many European countries have a lot of female politicians and engineers. And I believe that that's why they are advanced countries. Consider that many developing countries only work with one sex. Why is this problem? Imagine that you have a population of 1 million. And then by cutting 1 million into half and eliminating those 50% into trash, the country as a one single unity loses its power, human power. So by inviting the other sex and then inviting those talented people and become one, the country can be really advanced. And so we can extend this analogy into many other fields. Many people in one domain, meaning that imagine that I'm a, let's say that I am in urban science or urban studies. And imagine that by cutting out, okay, I'm an urban scientist. I don't want to be a mathematician or I'm not interested in mathematics. By defining that a territory is not mine by at the moment that you're cutting your mind and cutting out those things, you are eliminating the possibility yeah. that you can be powerful. And this is, I believe, that happening almost everywhere. So architects do not want to computer programming. And engineers who don't work with uh, social studies. And let's say that a mathematician who don't work with physics, physicists. So uh, what we have to solve these days is open our mind is the first step to be competent or be excellent. But unfortunately, this cultural thing doesn't really spread everywhere. It actually, the rather the society does changes very slowly. And we have really this closed mind itself. And I, I personally think that this will take a long time. That, uh, Yes, thank you. Thank you for your answer. Uh, Eduardo, okay. Uh, sorry that I have uh, two pages, but I only see the first page. So uh, please forgive me that I cannot see other hands probably in the page too. Okay, Eduardo. Yeah, hello, sir. Thank you for your presentation. That was really interesting. It showed like your experience, etc. And like it made me raise two particular questions. The first one is that you have shown really successfully the link between technology and also the impact it can have on people, especially on unemployment, et cetera. And then like you tackled a bit the theme of artificial intelligence. And so it made me raise two questions linked with artificial intelligence and innovation in general with urban city planning. So as urban, uh, sorry, as artificial intelligence is always becoming more important, what do you think are the ethical limits of this artificial intelligence in general? Like for instance, in terms of city planning, like can we impose to people some force of innovation they don't want to, or is there a, like a form of ethical limit to it? And then the second question is like, are they innovations that you don't want to see in some cities or innovations that, yeah, that exist, but that are not appropriate for at least some forms of city? So two questions first, ethics of artificial intelligence limits, and then like, what innovation should not be used in city, even if they exist? Uh, is your first question is ethics, the moral issues in AI? Uh, okay. Um, uh, I see the problem is us. <laughs> Any ethical issue, the problem is us, not the AI. So uh, here's the problem is that, so it's a kind of like a, a knife that we use it to save people, a knife that we use to threaten other people and take money out. So in terms of AI, so here's the thing, a car is a car. So, uh, but the problem is, well, 
how do we want to use a car? We can use a car to save a people who's hurting in the street and we uh, invite him, we can drive him to a hospital. Or we can use a car that, oh, I hate that, uh, that statue. And so I hit the statue and then we can remove it. So AI is a kind of things like that. But here again, um, uh, I want to go back to my favorite philosopher, Bruno Ratur. The key issue is not the capability of the AI, and it's not about the cap capability of AI. By combining AI and human being, we can jump to the next level of ethics. So meaning that uh, I personally believe that many ethical issues is related to transparency. So meaning that if I can hide myself from public, then I personally think that ethical issues coming out of those opaqueness. So I believe that I, AI can remove those opaqueness to the, and then we provide more transparency into every process of human life or human society. Such, for example, let's say that uh, in manufacturing process, there are companies who want to hide the main resource of the material. And there's a company who want to open the material to be used in the manufacturing. So let's, just, let's use more easier example. Let's, let's talk about some food restaurant. There's a restaurant who opens what kind of ingredients they use. And there's a restaurant who wants to hide what kind of ingredients they use. And AI, without knowing what kind of ingredients a restaurant use, simply AI can tell you how much ingredients a restaurant opened. So by kind of we evaluate a restaurant that, oh, the restaurant who open more ingredients, we can conclude that it is more trustable restaurant. So now it is whether we want to be more ethical or not, without, I mean, without intent to be more ethical or not, by simply being transparent and by knowing or by using AI, making more transparent, we can be jump into at next uh, ethical level. Uh, and then what is the second question? <laughs> the, the second question, yeah, you, you answered really well to the first. So first of all, thank you. And the second <laughs> one was really, how do you say? Yeah, what was basically like, I know that you studied a lot about innovations in smart cities, etc. So basically like what forms of innovation don't like you don't want to see ah. in like city planning, etc. Like, What's like, what's, which one did you see that were implemented and you think are not appropriate in some cities? Mm, interesting. Is there um, any? <laughs> recently, what I learned so far, because I have a, you, <laughs> I become transparent that I have a kid. <laughs> uh, as a father, what I recently learned is that we learn in a way do, we don't learn in a way not to do. That was very interesting notion to me. So meaning that please do something is a way that we learn something, but please do not do this. It doesn't really change their activities because the way we think is always positive way or, so here's the thing. So uh, I'm going back to another, my uh, favorite theorist, Josie Lakoff, who wrote, um, the metaphor we live by. Have you read that book? Do you read that? So uh, he gave very nice example. So everybody, please do not think elephant. Please do not think elephant. Please raise up if you do not think elephant now. So what he's saying is the way how our neurons work is never work in a negative way or 
uh, if I just kind of borrow uh, Joseph Fro uh, Freud's idea about um, cognitions and incognition, that cognition and incognition always work together, not in one way. So when we think about, when we define that, there is a such a direction that we don't want doesn't exist without thinking that the direction that we want to do. Uh, if I just kind of uh, rephrasing this question in a different way, imagine that we are in a dark cloud and then by kind of like a kind of like pushing hands away, you can actually light, uh, okay, let's say that our screen is filled with dust. And then only way to see where is the, our face is only way is kind of cleaning the dust away. But at first time, what we do is cleaning just anywhere. And by cleaning the more space out, by understanding the negative area of the cleaning, we know where our face is. I don't know if this is very clean to you or not, but what I'm saying is by uh, focusing on a negative way, we can identify where is the direction we know. What it means is only after we try, we know whether the result is good or bad. We only learn after we tried, because uh, this is kind of one of the things that I teach to my students is that our uh, reasoning is extremely limited by our experience. So uh, pre-expecting any result out of imaginary expectation doesn't work at all. Meaning that, uh, uh, so let's, let's see that uh, let's imagine that there's a new coffee shop opened in front of you, your university. The only way to know whether a new coffee restaurant's coffee is drinking. I mean, some, well, well, we can wait until someone says that, oh, those coffees are good or those, on other people say, that, oh, those coffees are bad. But still, only way to know the coffee is good or bad to my test is trying. So kind of like what I'm, so what I try to say is good or bad directions, we only knew after we tried. Because uh, the, the a kind of plan or a direction that we may, maybe that we, we hear everybody can consensus on, consensus on that, oh, this direction is good, so let's go that way. And let's imagine that there's another direction that everybody consent that this direction is bad, so we didn't go that way. But we do not know which one is good. The story is going back to actually Grand Canyon. So 10 years ago, I think it's a 16 or 20 years ago in Grand Canyon, they decided, they decided to kill all the wolves. So they kill all the wolf because the wolf killed all the animals and all the animals actually kind of uh, destroy. So they think that wolf kind of like uh, destroy all the Grand Canyon or I don't know, don't remember. But after 16, 16 years later, they realized that wolf is one of the essential parts of ecosystem. I don't know, you may heard the story about it because at first time, based on our limited understanding and based on our limited knowledge, something is, looks bad or something looks good. But if you kind of take action based on that limited knowledge and limited experience, we may lose a hidden link. So kind of that's something uh, I would say. So, we you need to know that we really need quite deeper understanding of a problem or direction, but I unfortunately uh, we need experience to actually learn the result. Okay, I don't know. Is it was it? It could be your answer. <laughs> For me, it was really clear. Oh, Thank okay. You. Thank you. All right. Next question. Uh, any 
Uh, who wanna go first? <laughs> I see a couple. I think Margo has uh, been uh, waiting. Okay. Yeah, okay, Margo. Uh, so I do enjoy your presentation and I, uh, I really liked all the information you shared with us, and I think that uh, your scale of work is fascinating for me because uh, it's so large. Uh, I, uh, I understand so I clearly understand you because uh, when I was a school student, I was preparing to enter architecture architectural university, and so I remember spending hours with this cutting knife and i have blisters on my fingers and so oh, yeah, yes. I, I understand that uh, the things you propose they are like they help to save so much time because uh, and being an architect it's so like uh you can uh, i think that a human should be responsible for creativity and machine yeah, exactly. can help to manage uh, other things to deal with other things but my question is like it's more particular uh -huh. uh, in your presentation, you mentioned um, the invention of such technologies with watercolors. Uh -huh. So this machine, and uh, I wanted to ask, um, is it like you have created like a code or a uh, yeah. code? And uh, it uh, can you can you explain in more particular the technology? I'm just interested in it. Uh, okay, so you can use any. Oh, okay, are you are you do you learn any computer programming language? Uh, no, <laughs> yeah, but I'm not so, uh, I'm not good at it, I think. Okay, so uh, then, okay, um, okay, first, okay, uh, okay, um, by focusing on your question, uh, uh do you know, um, pro have you heard about processing? Processing. Processing is a computer program language for artists. No, I haven't. Okay, so uh, my first suggestion is, uh, okay, here. <laughs> okay, now I'm uh, uh, going back to more realistic uh, answer. So, okay, on my second year in architecture school, I decided to make a metal, metal roof, and then metal roof that has almost 300 metal thin uh, sheet it is overlapped and overlapped and overlapped. And I cut every sheet. It was kind of like five millimeter and 10 centimeter sheet. It overlapped and overlapped and overlapped. I don't know why I did that, but. Uh, <laughs> she, she, she needs pee. <laughs> okay. Okay. I have yeah, a actually, I also <laughs> have five years old kids, so I do understand. Uh, okay. They normally need some support from the parents when uh, he wanted to go to the toilet. So please. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Going back to our story. Okay. So I cut five millimeters, five millimeter, ten centimeter metal sheet cut by hand manually. It took four hours in midnight. And then I, I slipped. And in my dream, I caught 30 of that. And then I wake up. And then the, the saddest thing I have is that in my dream, I cut 30s, I, ho I have all the tiredness in my body. But when I wake up, <laughs> I didn't have the 30s I cut in my dream. That, but what I'm trying to tell you is that that experience that about the cutting repeated job again and again and again is actually one of the basic skills of learning everything. So you will have the same feeling that when you learn computer programming, you are doing same coding again and again and again and again. And then that's why in a Hollywood movie, like the one of the the uh, great example is uh, Jurassic Park 1. There is a programmer who actually engineered all the Jurassic Park system who is very fat and always drinking Coca-Cola all the time. So what I'm saying is that any artistic process is a similar to programming process. So the experience you have in architecture field 
I'm guarantee that will be used in learning computer programming. And then, though, if you ask me how I did that, all the things, all the technical things are actually meaningless. But the way, the approach that how I did it is doing again and again and again and again. I write a code again and again after, so I write a one line of code and let the robot um, draw it. And then, oh, I need to change it. And I code it again and see it. And I do it again and see it and I do it again. I probably repeated this kind of more than 1000 times. So the basic way how I do that, repetition. Uh, technically, it is very easy. So you draw a line using mathematical formula like sine curve or cosine curve, and again and again and again, and using repetition. And then after that, you change the sine curve of the position coordinate into robotic coordinate. But the problem is the brush is actually there's no really a strict number to maintain to draw again and again. So your, whatever your virtual world simulation doesn't work with physical simulation. So what you have to do is after drawing and drawing again, you have to change the Z height again and again and again, and just see which one is the best. And to know the best height for a specific, a particular brush to draw the specific thickness of it or specific, some kind of like mergeness of a watercolor on a paper is so anal analogous. Yeah, I see. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. But whatever your experience in architecture will work for you very soon in any engineering or other field. Can you recommend any museum in Seoul or South Korea to visit in order to see objects like of this kind? Uh, can you say your question again? Can you recommend any museums in Seoul where, where I can see the objects of um, ah. such objects? Read philosophy. Uh, read. It's, it's not the outside object that you need to see. It's your brain to but activate. I, 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 just want to, uh, I just want to see uh, things, such kind of things in reality. So I was uh, like, uh, maybe uh, you are uh, familiar with this sphere. And so I just, uh, I just want to ask you advice. I, I like art objects and I like modern art. And uh, so I want to, uh, uh, I'm just interested. Maybe you can recommend a place to visit where uh, I can see objects of this kind in South Korea. Ah, in South Korea. I'm very sorry. There is no good place. <laughs> <laughs> oh, where are you now? In Seoul. Uh, my suggestion, go to the mountain, go to the sea, go to the river. Yeah. Because Korean uh, uh, kind of like uh, landscapes are so unique. Yeah. And, and, and for you, it's a great benefit because you have a culturally different, uh, ec uh, kind of culturally different, probably how to say, because you, because for your eyes, to my eyes, I don't see Korean trees or Korean rivers. It's just nothing because I see almost every day. Because I don't see, I, my eyes can see, but I don't see. Uh, but in case of you, you probably see very differently from us. Yeah, of course, because I have already been fascinated by the landscape, landscapes in the mountains. So. And then I actually, you are in Yonsei University, right? Yeah. Uh, walk, I, I rec strongly recommend walk outside of Yonsei University. I just have a nice coffee. And then uh, my suggestion, walk and walk and walk and just stop by very unknown restaurant that nobody will go and just try to eat that nobody will eat. That will, uh, that will remain in your brain for the rest of your life that triggered a lot of different things in your, in your brain. Thank you very much for your answers. Okay. okay uh... I, I have uh, one recommendation though. Uh, I believe Margot is kind of uh, fascinated by uh, Professor Park's approach of combining art and uh, technology. 
right? Mm -hmm. So uh, in that case, like yeah. uh, for example, Leonardo da Vinci <laughs> kind of pe people are uh, quite you know similar to uh, Professor Park's approach in my belief because it is kind of unique uh, because in Professor Park's approach, uh, he has this artistic in, uh, uh, insights, but uh, he kind of solves that out in a very engineering way uh, that can make it real, right? So, uh, well, it can be kind of my, uh, you know, one-sided perspective, but some of the, the, the arts kind of lack the kind of technological details. So it's just, you know, dreams. But some of the technology outputs, it kind of lacks the kind of artistic beauty. <laughs> so, uh, you know, one person who has both sides is kind of uh, rare in my opinion. So that's why Margot is kind of looking, uh, trying to, find out that kind of, you know, art, artworks <laughs> that has the kind of uh, scientific backgrounds. So maybe Leonardo da Vinci can be one example <laughs> that can meet your, uh, uh, you know, needs. So, uh, I know, I, I think there should be any place that has some artworks of Leonardo da Vinci. I'm not sure, but anyway, uh, that's something you may wanna look for or some of the media arts uh, have kind of, uh, it, it, it is limited to software aspect, but some of the media arts have that kind of aspect as well. So yeah, thank you. So Maria too, you waited long. <laughs> Davis? Lisa, I um, just wanted to say thank you so much for the presentation. It was really um, insightful and also um, quite inspiring to see all the things that you've kind of done um, within your life as well, which is quite nice. Um, so my question is kind of down to, you were talking about um, talking about something about the AI of like, like I think it was like an AI program that people use to learn code. Cause I'm, um, I've tried many times, I've done like, like so many courses sometimes and I always start it and I always end up like I'll pay for it and then not end up finishing it because I just kind of like oh yeah I didn't know just kind of stop <laughs> doing it yeah. so um what where could I find like access to the AI thing that you said could be helpful that's the first question and also my second question is that I'm quite I'm a I do mechanical engineer that's my major but I'm quite interested in like the um I guess more like the, the architectural side of it as well but I also I, I kind of think I have like a creative block in my mind as well so like what things do you think would be quite good to help my like to help you I get I guess get inspired and stuff and like see art and architecture and the simple things that um like around us I guess you already said something about like trying new things and stuff but like what other things do you think because I know it's something I could probably train so yeah that's my question oh yeah oh so you're finally with python uh, yes, I knew like the basics and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's enough. Python is such a great language. So such, just basic things are enough for you to try a lot of different things for everybody. So you probably know that uh, PyTorch. PyTorch Py, Py is a library for a deep learning. And it's very easy. Uh, and then OpenCV is a library that I use for all my computer vision applications. So Python, PyTorch, OpenCV. And then if you actually just find a couple of tutorials for these three, then you will be linked to another level of a lot of uh, great libraries. So that's a good starting point. And one of the biggest problem for any programming language learner is that it is actually you approach it as a language but many students approach it as an assignment. 
you know, projects <laughs> or courses. That's the biggest problem. So my best suggest suggestion is, yeah, to get a credit, yeah, you have to do something with your assignments or forget about it. So you need to do something that does not give you any rewards. That's a pure enjoyment. I, I don't know. That's something I want everybody to uh, learn it, that the more rewards you expect at the beginning, you will learn less. I believe that that's a truth. <laughs> there, there are not many truths that we can believe, but I believe it's a truth. So the more you do without expecting any return, then actually you will get the most out of it. Because it, that, it, that means it is a kind of self-motivated is the one, I think it's the kind of key for any successful life or any successful project. Any project that you want to get a good grade from this project will be failure. <laughs> then any project that you want to get a lot of money, you will get nothing. Any project you want to get any recognition, you will never get any recognition. But if you do something for yourself, you will get all of these three. But I cannot guarantee it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> But I believe that that's at least the, the best start point. So when you learn programming, just do something for your fun. That, that's the best, thing, best start point. Because, that, because that, this is what I learned. So I have to finish something uh, in time or I have to something finish in a semester. Then always what I try to find is the shortest pass. But the shortest pass does not guarantee you the best has so far because we have a lot of uh, Chinese students and Chinese professors here one of the best or the saying to me is actually the shortest past is not I uh, know physically shortest path is not the timely shortest path sometimes meandering may arrive you to the goal that you want in the fastest time Yes. So, uh, I, I, what I just kind of say is just enjoy, enjoy your wasting of your time and your talent. And then that will give you a lot of rewards. But don't expect any rewards. At the moment that you want something secondary, you will lose the original. Okay. Uh, I think there's one question in the chat room. Oh, yes. Africa. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, actually, I have an African friend, uh, every African student in my lab. Uh, 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 there's something uh, very difficult about Africa is that um, uh, it's a kind of a kind of social system. Okay, so the thing is that uh, when I work in the United States, it was so easy for me to find a lot of uh, a lot of parts, and it includes electronic parts and mechanical parts. It was just was just as easy for me to get them because because uh, I don't know if you ever heard about it. Um, what is the website that I always use? Mekata? Mekan. So, so there's a website that you can order almost any part, the same NASA engineers ordered, then any student can order the same mechanical part from the website. And then there is a so-called Mauser. And then there's also a website that any uh, electronic part, any uh, spec, any expert sensors you can buy online as any professional researchers do. So in United States, it was much easier for me to research because I can easily get those parts easily. But in Korea, I have such a difficulty in getting those parts here and way more expensive here. And in the United States, I can just go to Home Depot or there's a local hardware store that I can buy almost anything 
in five minutes, but here in, in Pohang, it was difficult, definitely almost impossible to get those parts here. So my research speed is definitely slowed down here. It's like one tenth of what I did in the United States. It's just my excuse that my performance is slower. Than, uh, it, that cannot be executed, but still, that's a that's kind of similar thing. But in Africa, so my student go back to Africa and he wanted to exactly almost similar thing that he did here in Korea, but it was so difficult because internet line was very difficult. And he actually came from, I don't know whether it is good to say it's in the country because uh, as soon as he returned to his country, he lost his laptop. Someone come to his house and then stole everything. And then his school, that's really not a good place to research. So everything is very different. So my suggestion for you is you need to find a way that you can, you, you need to start something you can do in Africa. Something very, and then something very easy. So uh, um, my suggestion, so I'm not so sure that how easy or how difficult to IoT devices there I don't know what, can you use Amazon there or can you use some European international delivery market? But my suggestion, just start from whatever you can start with. That's only solution probably because, yeah. But if you need any help, I'm very, uh, very happy to support you. Uh, I'd like to add a comment. Uh, yeah. Professor Park. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Uh, I actually, uh, you know, as a, as a, there is a tradition of, uh, uh, you know, engineering education at Tsinghua University, uh -huh. there is, a, there is a, a relatively large shop of offering different sorts of, uh, you know, components or um, what, what, what you have to say. Um, those engineering things mm. and it's just next to the campus mm. and students or faculties or staff they may go there and to uh, to choose what they want my favorite city is Shenzhen Shenzhen you can get almost anything there <laughs> uh, uh, I mean uh, you mean the, the, Shen Bay? the Shenzhen, or... the city above Hong Kong. Yes, I know. I know. Oh, yeah. I, I, I would like to know where. Ah, uh, sorry, sorry. sorry. Uh, uh, actually, there is uh, some industrial area that uh, I, I found, that I found out in the internet, a guy walk in the street and then he can buy almost any parts in the street. I, I tried to find the YouTube and the, he actually he mentioned the name of the city the street name, but I, I don't recall the name of it. Mm -hmm. But uh, actually um, many uh, PCB design electronic parts in, in international in the United States too, all the order actually go back to Shenzhen and then all the PCB design and the PCB fabrication is actually uh, produced in Shenzhen and internationally shipped to all over the world. And the price is unbelievably cheap. So if you wanna, develop your own, I don't know, Raspberry Pi or Arduino device. And what I'm by is a PCB design. The PCB circuit design, you design your own way without any parts. So actually they uh, print the circuit board and then uh, that's just $8. It's just extremely cheap for me. Uh, if you want, I can, okay, let me see. I can find the website that you can order then I can give it to you. Thank you, thank you. And then actually, I, uh, actually, I used to use uh, all the time AliExpress. <laughs> I don't know. Do you, can you use AliExpress in 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 China? I think it's, you can, right? I think so. I yeah. think so. Yes. So, yeah, uh, I, I really use heavily AliExpress to buy all the electronic parts. Thank you. Please go ahead. Mm -hmm. 
And I would like to add one comment to uh, uh, Leslie's question. Uh, you asked what kind of role AI can play in boosting the economy of Africa, but I would like to ask before you think about AI, what are required to boost the developing countries in Africa? <laughs> like what they need, defining what they need uh, will be the first step to, uh, you know, uh, think about, and then you can, uh, you know, go ahead and uh, think think more about if AI can be uh, the solution to solve that problem. So uh, thinking about the problem first uh, is kind of not that easy thing because when we uh, talk about you know all kinds of technologies we tend to focus more on the technology but uh, it's usually something uh, that is more basic like you know defining the problem is more important than uh, talking about uh, the technology itself so uh, I'd like to ask Leslie, uh, what are the, you know, the problems that has to be solved uh, in the countries in Africa will be the first step to think about. My additional comment is instead of focusing on Africa, just focusing on your neighborhood. So what kind of, uh, do you have any poultry farm there? Uh, Leslie, any chicken or goat or rabbit? I would start. Yeah, professor. What do you have around? Have poultry. Yeah, so I think that's a good starting point. You know, like automated water supply, automated food supply, automated cleaning, definitely. So start with that. So it's wise. It's much. It's much wiser than thinking about Africa as a continent or countries. Well, I I can make some episode for such kind of technology is not really the solution for some society. This episode it was done by some of the American students going to the Africa, and then they are trying to make a, what is a pipeline and the solar system and pumping systems to bring the water to their liver to their village. And then they are settled down and then turn on, everything is well. well. And then they come back one year later and then nobody using that system. Because that village, the woman tried to go to the water side and then making laundry and then chatting each other. That is a kind of communication between the village to village. So if you're making such kind of system with the technology that is not working and nobody want to use it. Mm. So we have to carefully look at the society and their, and also the technology level of the country and the village and so on. So not just using one of or two of technology into the village or nations or the Africa totally, it doesn't work sometimes. Mm -hmm. So look at the first, look at what is they are needed and then if they are needed, step by step is the important too. If you give what is a high technology in that country, sometimes it's not working well. We don't understand why it's not working, but the country itself cannot digest such kind of technology into their country. So that is one thing we have to be carefully 
Thank you. All right, Professor Lim's comments remind me of one example also. Uh, there was uh, this design team in Stanford. Uh, they kind of wanted to, uh, you know, bring some incubators for uh, early born babies uh, to Indian, India in uh, suburban uh, rural areas. And they brought like, you know, two or three uh, incubator machines to uh, a local hospital there. But in a few months, they visited the hospital again to figure out if they are using the incubator well. But turns out uh, the incubator was not even uh, operating. Uh, that is not being used. So they wanted to figure out why. Uh, it turns out uh, the babies die uh, more often in their uh, houses where they are born rather than, you know, coming to the hospital. Uh, that was the, the real problem there. So the, the design team uh, changed the, the plan uh, on site. They decided to uh, make a blanket rather than an incubator uh, with an embedded heat generator uh, inside the blanket so that uh, you know, it can be much cheaper than an incubator. And it, they kind of distributed the blanket uh, to you know, rural areas. And it kind of uh, helped, really helped a lot to lower the, the, the death rate of the, the early born babies uh, in India. It was one of the very um, well, Non success story uh, from the Stanford D school uh, at the time. Well, Professor Bob is uh, emphasized the experience for the studies and, and invention, something, and then using the technology. That is, uh, yeah, I totally agree with it. Experience is very, very important. One of the example for the experience has uh, some of creativity to the research. He is an Italian, I forgot his name. And he is trying to figure it out when, the, he is a jewelist and then try to figure it out when the ethnic mountain is a, the eruption. And he tried to put the geophone into the ground and then he recording every single moment. And he tried to make her music with the, that geophone. And he, he noted the, the music and then tried to figure it out when the climax is, goes on. It seems like a very inventive and creative work for the expecting to when the eruption is coming in. The reason why he can do it, he was a musician when he was young. He tried to be the musician before. And then finally he turns to the, the geo, geo scientist. He has the background for the music. That's why he tried to make a music with the geophone sound. So experience give you a lot of different aspect of view to the approaching your work and your technology, the application things. So experience is the one of the key issue for your creativity and then thinking the problem and criticize the problem, everything. So experience is important. So do anything. If I were you guys age, I will try to do anything as like a Professor Bach mentioned, go to any restaurant and then drinking coffee or eat some food. 
in the menu, whatever it is, it is fine. Just try it. That is important. Okay, maybe one last question. Nobody? Um, sorry, really quickly, I just wanted to ask, Professor Park, say, do you, you are from Postec, right? I think from Postec, sorry? Uh, uh, yeah, ah, as, I'm Postec. Okay, great. Okay, um, so if you're, if you're um, at the university, do you have like an office or something that you could like let us know just, just because I'd like to ask some more questions as well? That oh, would be sure, possible. Yeah, so I just type in here. So anyone you're interested, um, my lab is actually by name. Uh, uh, wait a second, I'm typing now. Uh, this is my website. And actually you can have all the information. And then uh, recently I opened uh, another, uh, actually I, I'm directing the uh, makerspace of the post -tech, So. You come here, postecms.com, so you can actually uh, see uh, uh, another uh, layer of my work. Oh, yeah. right. Great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Actually, I, uh, recently I teach uh, teenage kids uh, programming. Uh, it was a disaster, I have to say. <laughs> I, I feel like uh, teaching uh, kittens and uh, kind of uh, dozens of kittens and they're like, okay, so uh, Sensei is a kind of teacher. They, they don't even call me professor. They just teach me teacher. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> well, it was really fun. I have to say, um, uh, it, it was so interesting to me is that um, so I selected, uh, so I asked, why do you want to learn from this workshop? And then <laughs> basically I selected students who write longer. So I sorted their answer in <laughs> uh, Excel sheet and I selected the longest answer first. And I realized that they are all female students. Oh. So something has been changing. So I actually, I kind of like, uh, for the next workshop, I kind of like, uh, Asked to my uh, researchers that should we ask the question of whether you are boys or girl? We decided not to include it, but still, uh, this kind of uh, imbalance between male and female students is are quite surprising. I have only one or two male kids. Professor Park, this yeah. always a kids is answered by male kids answered by yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> I also think there there were some bias there. <laughs> I think the truth is their parents write the answers for their kids. I, I, I personally think. And then I think the female kids' parents are more aggressive than their male kids. <laughs> that is my assumption. Well, we need some data. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. I think, oh, should I say that or I just left it to... Uh, well, uh, because that was not exactly a question. I would like to ask once more if there is any question. Any, any more burning question? last question? Uh, last question. Otherwise, Maybe, maybe we can uh, call it a day today. I see a dog there. <laughs> thank you, Professor oh. Park. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank That's you. good. Dog. I have an additional listener. <laughs> okay, so uh, maybe this is it for today's class. Thank you so much for attending everyone.
see you next week. Next week's uh, lecture is Professor Jun Hong Park, not <laughs> Jun Hong Park again. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you, sir. See you next week. Bye, Professor. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. I hope you can do it. 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 I hope you 학생들이 수업을 깎아 잘라 매번 잘라 먹었다 이런 생각을 안 하겠죠. 박 교수님 짤 얄짤 없어. <웃음> 이렇게 좀 꽉꽉 채워서 예 해야 될것 같아. <웃음> 네. 아이고 오늘 수고 많으셨어요. 네. 수고하셨습니다. 네. 쉬세요. 네. 수고하셨습니다. 네. 네. 아, 박준 교수님 자료 네. 보내 주시면. 아, 네, 알겠습니다. 네. 감사합니다. 네.